So we began our Advent series last week by remembering everyone's favorite Christmas grouch. Nope, not the green one. The older one, Ebenezer Scrooge. He was visited by the ghost of his former business partner, Jacob Marley, uh, before being visited by the ghost of Christmas past, where he attempted to extinguish the light of this ghost. We were shown what led him to this greed and loneliness, and after he'd had too much, he tried to extinguish the light. But as John's description of Jesus as the light of the world says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And in that light, we can find more fulfillment in our creator than in the things that he's created. So that brings us to the present. Go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. The gospel according to Matthew chapter 1. Turn in those pew Bibles. Help the people in the row with you. Slide on down. Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. And we'll stop there. Joseph is not a bad man in our estimation. In fact, given the circumstances, I'd say he's, he's acted quite reasonably. Even as I analyze the text, I can't say that Joseph has done anything different from what I would do in this situation, which is using his, his logic and his intellect to make this decision. Unfortunately, that's where I often think I get ahead of myself and stumble. You see, it doesn't say anything about prayerful consideration or or seeking the counsel of a rabbi. Meticulous Matthew doesn't say that Joseph took it to his friends and family so that they could discuss it, his options. No, Joseph worked this out in his own mind. And, and God sent his angelic messenger, as we're about to read, uh, as, as we'll read later, he sent his angelic messenger because Joseph was about to make a huge mistake. He was about to quietly remove himself from the biggest event in the history of mankind. Now, we know this in hindsight, of course. But Joseph was experiencing it in the present. So, it's easy for us to read verse 19 and then just rush through it. But what happens if we sit right here? Forget what's about to happen and put yourself into Joseph's position. Joseph is a just man. It says that. He, he obeys God's law. He loves Mary. His future is bright and full of hope. And then he finds out that his wife is pregnant. And it's not his. I mean, he couldn't be because, because they haven't consummated their marriage. So Joseph decides to follow the law. And he does it with, with mercy and grace, not wanting to put her to shame, but he does that out of love for Mary. Now, the last time we saw Ebenezer Scrooge, he was emotionally mo moved by the events, by his visions of his past. But when he had had too much for his own liking, well, he attempted to extinguish the light of this ghost of Christmas past, only to find out that he couldn't. And instead, he falls into a deep sleep. And let's read what happens next. Come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit. He was not the dogged Scrooge he had been, and though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple deep green robe or mantle bordered with white fur. The garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capacious breast was bare, as if disdaining to be warded or concealed by any artifice. Its feet, 
observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare. And on its head, it wore no other covering than a holly wreath set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eyes, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. Girded round its middle was an antique scabbard, but no sword was in it. And the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. You have never seen the like of me before, exclaimed the spirit. Never, Scrooge made answer to it. Had never walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning for I am very young. My elder brother is born in these later years, pursued the phantom. I don't think I have, said Scrooge. I'm afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirit? More than 1,800, said the ghost. A tremendous family to provide for, muttered Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas present rose. And since it came up in Bible study, uh, 1,800, because the present only lasts this one day. See, Scrooge is somewhat changed but he hasn't quite gotten the point just yet has he well, scrooge is a man who lives in the past or the future the 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 guilt and shame of his past or or the anxiety that he feels about an uncertain future he's never met the present before because he avoids it you see, he makes decisions, uh, decisions that are, that are past, and then he stews over whether or not he made the right decision, which only gives him anxiety about the future and whether he'll make the right decisions then. See, like Joseph and Scrooge, we, we often ask God to bless our decisions after the fact. And my example is going to be for Gen Xers and Millennials, but, but I think this applies to all people who have made these major life choices. But Gen, -ers, Gen Xers and Millennials specifically, we graduated high school with the expectation of going to college. And we took on mountains of debt in order to make that happen. Because we were taught that you had to have a college education if you wanted to make it anywhere in this world. And then we graduated and we took any job, we, we interviewed, and we took any job that we could get because we were desperate to pay off that debt. And then for me, well, I went into acting because people told me that it couldn't be done. You can't make a career out of it. And I proved them wrong, by the way. I, I had a, a successful, uh, as it goes, acting career for over a decade. But at what cost? I never consulted God about that career choice. And, and maybe, maybe you've been in that same boat. And, and then some of us waited until after college to get married, uh, until after school to get married. But I never prayed to God to send me a good, godly wife. No, no, fortunately... Fortunately, God sent and brought Ashley and I together. Now, when it was time to have kids, we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into in many ways. We just knew that the clock was ticking. See, what I'm saying is I, I spent several years of my life making decisions and then hoping that God would make it all work out in the end. And I called it living by faith. But the reality is, it was this willful ignorance. I wanted control. And, and I got that control by, by making those decisions and then asking God to bless it. That, that his will, well, well, that it becomes my will. <laughs> That, that he would change himself in, instead of changing me. See, we all want this control. God loves us and he knows what's best for us, but, but we have this desire 
to leave a legacy, to make these decisions that we hope will help us live on the same as, as Scrooge wanted in the end. And what is a legacy more than our desire for eternal life? And, and hopefully everybody in this room knows, knows this, but, but we have eternal life in our Savior Jesus Christ. But that is a difficult reality. I, eternity is a difficult concept to understand in our reality in this life. So we make these decisions that we hope will help us live on. And we make these decisions in fleeting things, in, 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 in this turmoil. As David writes, surely for nothing we are in turmoil. He says in, verse, in, in Psalm 39. You see, eternity is our reality in Christ, but turmoil, turmoil is our experience in life. We spend it on turmoil, like, like spending hours at work so that we can buy an overpriced home or a car that could be taken away from us in an instant. We spend it on turmoil, like, like scrolling through social media or, or watching old television shows and wishing that we had that life when we should just put our phones down and turn off the TV and experience the joy of the life that is right in front of us. The day that is right in front of us. We spend it on turmoil, like, like for parents, spending our savings on, on our kids' extracurricular activities, which will have a temporary impact on their life when we should, and we often neglect, spending that energy on discipleship at home. And in our church family, which is going to have an eternal impact on their lives. And, and this turmoil, well, it means that we have the gift of today. The present. The, we have the gift of today and we do not know if it is the last one that God will bless us with. Well, let's look back at our gospel text. Verse 20, where we left off. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. God sent his angelic messenger to Joseph in order to strengthen his trust and his faith, not in his logic, not in his own logic, but in his creator. God then took Joseph, as undeserving as he was, as any of us would be, and he made him the earthly father of his only begotten son, the savior of all mankind. See, Joseph could have become a footnote, quite literally a footnote, referred to as Mary's former husband by biblical scholars. But instead, God gave Joseph a new day. And God has also given us a new day in Jesus Christ. Jesus came down, became an infant for our sake. He, he chose to number his days so that he could remove the number of our days. So we don't have to worry about eternity. We don't have to worry uh, about, about how we live on, about how we build our legacy, because that is in the secure and capable hands of Jesus Christ. So you know what we get to do? We don't have to worry about our past as well, because those sins have been removed from us. 
The guilt and shame that we feel has, has been paid for with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We don't have to worry about eternity because that's secure in Christ. So what we get to do is we get to experience the joy of today. Jesus has given us the gift of joy today. And, and because we have that, that, that joy for today, well, we can use our work to glorify him. Because Jesus has given us joy for today, you know what you get to do? You get to celebrate life with your friends and family. Because Jesus has given us joy for today, well, well, we can use our time to be intentional about our relationships, discipling our children, discipling our, our, our spouse or, or our friends or family, discipling others in our church body. And, and when we do that, everything points to Jesus. The way that we respond in gratitude to this gift of joy is, is, is first, we can, we can intentionally find joy in our relationships with others. And, and I know some of you might think that's easy. Some of us find it very difficult. <laughs> but, but when you really look for the joy in another person, you expect to see the joy and, and you see them as our Father in heaven sees them. Well, then he can open your heart to the joy that they may bring into your life. And, and then in that joy, well, well, then you can do like Bing Crosby did in White Christmas. You can count your blessings. And I don't mean this as like some mental exercise. No, I'm saying set a timer for five minutes this week and, and take out a notepad and write down as many blessings as you possibly can in that time. I promise you, you you're going to run out of time. And, and that's why I say set a timer, because you could spend your whole life counting those blessings. And, and in that joy, and in and, and understanding and seeing the blessings that have been given to us by God, well then you can evaluate how you use your time. To be intentional about it. And, and, and I'm saying that evaluate the hours that you spend on something and you'll see what's important to you. And not just the hours that you spend, not just the minutes. Well, I'm saying also the value of that time. Because we all have these pockets of energy where, where we feel energy and optimism during the day. Some of that, during this holiday season, please use some of that to pour into the ones that you love. See, the gospel reassures us that, that if we recognize the gift that today is, then we can glorify God in all that we do. If we intentionally find that joy in our relationships, if we, if we count our blessings, if we, if we evaluate how we use our time and how it can better be used to the glory of God, well, well then we point others to the eternal joy of Jesus Christ. What a better message for this Christmas holiday than to point others to Christ. To God be all glory in heaven and on earth, now and forever. Amen.